What's up, everybody? Welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. All we're doing today is breaking down the play-in tournament. I'm going to make my picks and talk about the games that I find to be most interesting, starting with the Nets at home hosting the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, one thing that we have heard coming down the pipeline is that the Cavs are pessimistic about whether or not Jared Allen will be able to play in the game when he's working out He seems to only be using his left hand. He's downgraded from a really stiff brace to wearing some tape, but it doesn't seem to be working. So it looks like Jared Allen's not going to play. And that's an issue because in a game like this, you have two teams with extremely different styles. Like No one expects the Cavs and Darius Garland to be in in like Karis LeVert to be able to out-execute offensively the likes of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, that's completely unrealistic. But they have massive advantages that they bring to the table, especially on the uh, on in the paint. Um, their ability with their size, with Laurie Markkinen at small forward, with Evan Mobley at the four, and with Jared Allen at the five, gives them the ability to hold opponents with those three on the floor to 102 points per 100 possessions, specifically only 41.5 points per 100 possessions in the paint which would lead the league. To give you an idea as just some perspective, the Miami Heat in totality lead the league in paint points allowed at 42.4. So when they have their guys, they're a dominant interior defense. They're a team that would give the Brooklyn Nets a ton of problems on the interior. Another thing that's so important about Jared Allen is his ability to punish switches. Part of what made Jared Allen suddenly not necessarily worth his full contract, but way less of an issue at that big of a salary number, is he can do what Rudy Gobert can't. When he switches on to a smaller defender and you dump the ball into him in in the post, he is capable of consistently punishing those types of mismatches. So I would certainly give the Cavs a better chance if they had Jared Allen because they would have a big advantage that they can bring to the table. But without Jared Allen, and it looks like he's not going to play, I have a Nets team that has Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, a significantly better set of perimeter initiators, and and going up against Darius Garland and Karis LeVert, and I think they're just in over their heads in a lot of different ways there. I expect the Nets to pack the paint and take away as many of those driving opportunities and dump-off lob opportunities as they can in the Cavs' pick-and-roll and and force guys to knock down shots. And I just don't think that they'll be able to score anywhere near consistently enough. Another big thing, let's say that they go Evan Mobley. Let's say the Cavs go Evan Mobley at center, which I expect them to do for the most part during the game. And they funnel everything into that and expect Evan Mobley to control the paint. Like I've always said, that has a lot more impact on guys, stars in particular, that are obsessively trying to drive to the basket. And that's not the way Kyrie and KD play. Kyrie and KD are at their most comfortable when they're operating in the the mid-range, in single coverage, making a move against a defender to get to a pull-up jump shot. Those are their bread and butter plays for those two guys. The Cavs are not a good perimeter defense team. Darius Garland's not a great perimeter defender. Laurie Markkinen's got length and size, and he can play some good positional defense from time to time, but he's not a guy that's great at containing in dribble drive scenarios. So I expect to see a lot of Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant just getting to their spots and knocking down shots. Also, the, this Cavs team relies entirely on Darius Garland for everything that they do offensively. This year, they are 10.6 points better on offense with Garland on the floor than with him off. That's something that the Nets will be able to game plan around to make up for their limited defense just by devoting all their attention to that screen and roll action and forcing guys to make shots on the back end. Cavs also not a great road team this year. They were only 19 and 22. One last little interesting note on this game. There's a question to be asked about whether or not Brooklyn would be best served losing. Now, you guys know how I feel about that kind of stuff. I'm a big believer in don't toy with the basketball gods. Play the game the way it's supposed to be played, and if you are the best team, things will work out for you. I've always been a big believer in that sort of thing, so I would not recommend losing. But if you are a Nets fan, and they happen to lose to the Cavs tomorrow, the advantage there is getting the one, uh, getting the eight seed and going to play Miami in the first round. I know for a fact the Nets 
are going to be favored in that series and be the team. The They may not be favored, but I will be picking the Nets for sure to beat the Miami Heat. I do not believe in the Miami Heat's offense. I, I believe that the Brooklyn Nets will pick them apart. I saw that happen the last time they played each other. The Nets went into Miami and utterly destroyed them. So I would pick the Nets in that series. Nets, Boston, that's a little more of a toss-up. With, that, with Rob Williams in the picture, I would absolutely be picking Boston. Without Rob Williams, it's closer. That takes away, like I said, one of those interior advantages that you can bring against Brooklyn. But I like that I, 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 it's an interesting conundrum because if they do what they're supposed to do and they beat Cleveland tomorrow, they will face a significantly tougher first round opponent than if they lose that game and try to make things work against in the second playing game to play against Miami. So that would be an interesting conundrum. I expect them to win and go up against Boston. That's more of a coin flip series. Once we get the final results of the playing game, there's no games on Thursday and I will do a breakdown of what I expect in those first round series. But let's move on to Atlanta and Charlotte. So I like Charlotte better in a vacuum as a basketball team. They, over the last 15 games of the season, were 11-4, and four, which was tied for the best record in basketball. Obviously convoluted a little bit by the fact that so many of the best teams in the league were resting key players in preparation for the playoff run, but still nothing to slouch at. They were second in offense over that span, which is not a surprise. They're a up-tempo, high, a high-paced team. LaMelo Ball is one of the best... Uh, uh, I know he's young. I know he's inconsistent. I know he has iffy shot selection sometimes. He's not a great defensive player, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but he's already one of the best high pick and roll playmakers that we have in the league. I love Terry Rozier's game. I talked about this a little bit the other day when we were talking about potential Russell Westbrook swaps. Very good polish in the mid-range, very dynamic score from the perimeter. And then the, one of the most interesting elements of this team and their future is Miles Bridges. Uh, he kind of coming out of college was this freak athlete. I kind of saw him as more of like a undersized version of John Collins, a guy you'd use as a vertical spacing threat and like screen and roll actions and maybe some defensive assignments that he'd be able to use his athleticism in. But he's legitimately turned himself into a really good offensive wing player. And the result has been, like I said, the second best offense in the league over the last 15 games. I like Charlotte individually in this matchup. The tricky thing is home court. The Hawks have massively underachieved this year. Very disappointing after what was a very impressive run to the conference finals last year. But this year, they're 27 and 14 at home. When you factor in a single game elimination format, how raucous that environment's going to be, it makes it a lot more complicated uh, it, it makes it a lot more complicated than I would have originally thought. Now, the interesting element here is both teams have really bad defensive backcourts. So everyone thinks of Trey Young being a limited defensive player. And obviously, Lou Williams, if from all the way back when he was with the Clippers, it has been attacked by really good teams as, as frequently as they can when he's on the defensive end of the floor. But the same problem exists for Charlotte. They play Isaiah Thomas as their backup point guard now. That's a re- that's arguably the worst defensive player in the entire NBA. And then LaMelo Ball. I do believe one day he'll become a decent defender in a switching scheme. He's a little too tall and slender to successfully chase guys over the top of screens. He's too easy to screen. So I think his defensive potential is in more of a switching scheme. That said, he right now doesn't have anywhere near the attention to detail on that on the end of the floor to be a productive player, gets back cut on all the time, misses help responsibilities often, and then he can give up a lot of dribble penetration at the point of attack. So what you have is two backcourts. Obviously, they're staggered in a lot of different ways, but at any given moment, both teams have a really, really bad perimeter defender on the floor. So so much is going to come out, come down to Those two guards, Trey Young and LaMelo Ball, are going to be really comfortable for most of that game, and it's going to come down to which guy has the best game. My gut tells me that Atlanta could win at home uh, off the strength of their home crowd, but I'm picking Charlotte by a hair because I believe they're a better basketball team that's playing a little bit better as of late, and I think that's going to carry them. All right, let's move on to the Wolves and the Clippers. 
This one is a really tough matchup for me to gauge based on what happened in the regular season. Not a lot of data there from their individual matchups that's usable. They played three times in November and the Clippers won all three games, but that's November. Both teams are monumentally different at this point, especially the Timberwolves. They've been one of the better teams in the league over the course of the last couple of months. And then in January, the two teams played in the Wolves, had a convincing win, but a lot of important players from the Clippers were missing, including Paul George, Luke Kennard, Marcus Morris, and a bunch of others. So not much you could take away on that front. The interesting wrinkle here is Minnesota is at home. They're 26 and 15 at home this season. I've talked about this a lot on the show. They are super athletic. Everyone thinks of Carl Towns and D'Angelo Russell, but they've got a bunch of athleticism on the wings and those guys feed off of the energy of that crowd, which carries them on the defensive end of the floor. The, the Where this game teeters towards the Clippers, in my opinion, and the reason why I'm picking the Clippers, is one, the Clippers know exactly who they are in this type of setting. The Clippers have a bunch of huge road playoff wins, even with this core, even just with Paul George. Them going on the road to beat Phoenix in Game 5 last year. Them going on the road to beat the Jazz last year in Game 5. A lot of big playoff wins with that group. They're going to be comfortable in Minnesota in that environment. They're not going to be scared away at all. And then, like I've talked about nonstop, I don't trust the Wolves' guards to make good decisions enough. The Clippers are going to do a lot of switching, especially on the perimeter. They'll do drop coverages when they have their traditional centers on the floor, but you're going to see a lot of switching on the perimeter, and there's going to be a lot of moments where it's going to be Anthony Edwards or D'Angelo Russell having to make decisions against a very good Clippers defense, and I trust Reggie Jackson and Paul George to out-execute them in that sort of setting. So, interesting matchup on some levels. Home court makes it a wrinkle. Carl Anthony Towns is a huge matchup problem. If Carl Anthony Towns goes for 40 and 17, yeah, that could swing it. It's certainly close. All of these matchups that we're talking today are close, except for maybe Brooklyn, Cleveland. But I'm leaning towards the Clippers because of their playoff experience, their modern approach to the game, and I think their primary decision makers are better and more reliable in this setting. Last but not least, the Pelicans and the Spurs. Not going to talk too much about this one. I don't find this matchup particularly interesting. Two very young teams with two interesting stars kind of leading the way in Brandon Ingram and in DeJounte Murray. DeJounte Murray killed the Spurs the last time, or killed the Pelicans the last time these two teams played when both teams were at full strength, which is shortly after the trade on February 12th. CJ McCollum played really well in that game as well. He's going to be that weird veteran presence in that game that's going to be the most comfortable. I'm leaning towards the Pelicans because of home court, but this one's a coin flip to me between two really young, talented teams that are kind of just excited to be there. And so it'll be an interesting wrinkle. I would lean towards the home court in an environment like this where Spurs team is super young on the road. So I have the Nets over the Cavs, the Hornets over the Hawks. That means that the Hornets and the Cavs will be playing for the eight seed. I'm going to pick the Hornets there as well. Once again, Jarrett Allen being out, I just consider to be too big of a, of a, of a, of a, of a obstacle for the Cavs to overcome. I'm a huge believer in this Cavs core and what they can do going forward. But with Jarrett Allen being out, I just don't think they can get it done. So I've got the Nets getting the seven seed and the Hornets getting the eight seed. Out West, Clippers over the Wolves, Pels over the Spurs. That means the Wolves will host the Pelicans for the eight seed, and I would absolutely pick the Pelicans, or excuse me, pick the Wolves in that game at home. I think one of the Pelicans' biggest strengths is all of their length and athleticism on the wings. We talked about this a lot in their matchups with the Clippers, and the Wolves are just athletic enough and young enough at those positions to match that effort, especially at home. And then it's going to come down to Carl Anthony Towns trying uh, uh, just trying to overpower that thin interior from the uh, the Pelicans and I like them in that matchup so that's going to end up in my opinion with the Nets at the seventh seed in the east and the Hornets as the eighth seed and out west with the Clippers as the seventh seed and with the Timberwolves as the eighth seed all right guys that is all I have for tonight I will be getting back to you guys with some instant reaction right after the playing games tomorrow we'll find out if I was right or not